Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic, and I'm delighted to have with me my colleague, Dr. Mohamed Al Kouli, uh, in the Department of uh, the Division of Interventional Cardiology, an expert in many things, including left atrial appendage closure. Mohamed, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me this morning. So let's start off with left atrial appendage closure. What is the procedure, and when do we do it? So the left atrial appendage closure is an alternative to blood thinner for patients with atrial fibrillation who are at increased risk of stroke, but they're intolerant of blood thinners. Um, blood thinners are the mainstay therapy for stroke prevention in these patients, but many of them do not tolerate that because of bleeding, fall risk, and other side effects. So the, uh, this procedure came about as an alternative to blood thinner in these selected group of patients. How did that come about? What's the history? Who came up with this idea? And, and yeah, so that's a great question. Develop? Yeah, so we have a we have a little bit of a unique uh, legacy here at Mayo Clinic with that. You know, the the data uh, from Mayo that by Dr. Blackshear had shown that uh, there is a thrombogenic crawl for this cold DSAC or little pocket on the side of the heart that's called the left atrial appendage, and since then more and more investigations confirmed that. Uh, so it's sort of a local therapy instead of a generalized blood thinning therapy that provides equal stroke prevention. So it came really from that data from Blackshear, and then it was confirmed by subsequent trials that confirmed equal stroke prevention with uh, closing that, that uh, appendage. So the idea is there's this little bag connected to the heart, this appendage, and we close it off, and then you don't need to use blood thinners because clots can't go flying off and cause trouble. But what about surgery versus catheter closure? Do you want to make a quick comment about that? Right. So surgery actually was the first method that was tried out uh, to close the appendage. It is still commonly used, but only in patients who are already undergoing surgery. There was a, a groundbreaking, actually, randomized trial recently confirmed uh, that that's even more and more appealing now to do routinely with cardiac surgery in patients with atrial fibrillation. However, you know, surgery is not without risk. And if, if the main, if the patient does not need another surgical procedure, all what they need is closing the appendage, we have a much more uh, simpler or less uh, invasive alternative now with transcatheter closure. So how less invasive is it? Do you need general anesthesia? What, what's the patient experience? Yeah, so traditionally, the procedure has been done um, by general anesthesia and uh, with transesophageal echo guidance. However, we have also the unique experience here of having been on the forefront of pioneering a minimally invasive approach where we do this with moderate sedation and intracardiac echo. We have uh, seen similar efficacy and safety with that approach, and uh, patients love it. Um, they don't have to be you know, subject to general anesthesia, and they're much more likely Likely to go home sooner. So we've been very pleased and satisfied with that approach and we've switched almost exclusively to doing that. So in other words, some people go home the same day? Yep. Yeah. It depends on what time of the day the procedure is done. And as you know, we're referral center. So if the patients don't live too far away, then they have the option of going home later in the day. Tell me about after the procedure, what kinds of medicines are people usually put on? And Obviously, the main reason to have this procedure is to prevent the risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation without the need for blood thinners. Right. So how many people get off blood thinners? What do you take afterwards? What is that like? Yeah, so uh, with the newer with the newer devices, the seal of the left atrial appendage is almost complete in the ma vast majority of patients. So in the older days, there used to be a certain number of patients who would still need a blood thinner because the device wasn't able to exclude the appendage completely. That is very rare now. So with that in mind, the only indication to stay on a blood thinner long term is if the patient develops another you know medical problem that requires blood thinner thinners like a pulmonary embolism for example, but we require a short or we, we suggest a short course of anticoagulation after the procedure, mostly to let the body heal over the device and individualize the device. Um, that is being debated now, and there are newer studies showing that you might be able to mitigate that use by just using dual antiplatelet therapy. So more is being done, and there's a lot of variability, uh, but in our practice, we almost exclusively have almost all patients off the blood center by a few, in a few weeks. So typically then it would be 
45 days or less of a blood thinner, and then you're strictly on aspirin and aspirin-like medications. Right. And we have also, like, if the patient has had an intracranial bleed or some other major bleeding problem and they're afraid of going back on the blood thinner, we have been doing the dual antiplatelet therapy option for six months, and that have been successful. As you know, we have also uh, gathered data or self-multinational data that showed no major difference in risk of clotting of the device with dual antiplatelet versus a blood thinner. What is the risk of clots forming on the device? How common is it and how do you manage it? Right. With the older generation devices, it's reported, it's variable, but it's reported to be between 3 and 4%. With the newer generation device, we have about 2% risk. So it's not zero, unfortunately, but uh, it's low. And it has to do also with other patient risk factors like advanced heart failure, advanced atrial fibrillation. The, the sad news is that it's a major event. The good news is that the vast majority of them respond to restoration of blood thinners. So, you know, it's counterintuitive that we want to get the patient of the blood thinner, but if they, if they are among these one or 2% who develop this problem, then we could put them back on a blood thinner and it dissolves in the vast majority of patients. Great. What's new in the field? Well, tell me about upcoming trials and how you see this advancing. Yeah, lots is new. So uh, uh, lots is going on. You know, the, the trials that led to the approval of the device were done in about a thousand patients, give or take. Now we have many more trials, at least five major trials with near 10,000 patients being enrolled. And the purpose of those trials are to first investigate if, if, the, if the left atrial appendage closure can actually be an alternative, even without the need for a problem to do that, right? So you don't have to bleed or had, you know, a hemorrhagic stroke or fall to qualify for this, would it apply to almost all comers who are taking contemporary blood thinners? So that's one caveat that the trials are trying to, to do. So in other words, let me, let me just pin that one down a little bit more so that it's completely clear to everybody. We're talking about someone has atrial fibrillation. They have a risk for stroke because of their CHADS VASC. Or, and again, as everyone here listening understands, CHADS VASC is the presence of congestive heart failure, hypertension, age over 65, diabetes, stroke, age over 75, or vascular disease, or being a woman. And you get a point for each of those in essence, two for stroke. So if that score is above three right now is when we would indicate, say, G really would be a candidate for this. If it's above one is when we give blood thinners. And the upcoming studies will determine whether instead of waiting for an event, you simply meaning being at risk for bleeding, you simply could say, close the appendage as opposed to blood thinner. Right, because also, you know, we're, we're talking about AFib as an epidemic, and we have a lot of younger patients now with atrial fibrillation. So talk about 20, 30 years of a blood thinner versus, you know, a left atrial appendage closure. There is a slight upfront risk, but the device is fairly safe now, and that would mitigate many, many years of blood thinners. So this, these trials will answer that exact question. Do I need to have an event? to qualify for this or not really can i can i just select to have it if i if i wish mm -hmm. so so we will know the answer in a in a few years hopefully for that uh, particular question another major question is among you know as we talked earlier patients who undergo surgery they have oftentimes get their appendage closed at the same time. In the transcatheter world, that's not common. You know, we, we're, we're sort of like do procedures independently in different occasions for variable reasons. Uh, so there are studies and we're leading uh, a couple of those studies. One, for example, is investigating if we could do left atrial, if doing left atrial appendage closure at the time of transcatheter mitral repair, let's say the mitral clip procedure, for example, would provide benefit to the patient. Or if you're doing atrial fibrillation ablation, rather than bringing the patient back for a second procedure, you're already there, can you just you know do it at the same time? So those would be very good logistically for a patient, and I think it will be safer, but we will know the trials are ongoing and we will find out. The, I think another category of trials that are ongoing uh, have to do with addressing difficult anatomies, you know, custom-made procedure devices that can, you know, fit areas in the heart or certain appendages that are not amenable to closure with commonly used devices and stuff like that. So it's a very, I mean, a lot is, is going on. And I think the next five years will, will, will show us a continuous evolution of this field. Well, uh, Dr. Alcooley, thank you for joining us. It's a very exciting time, and the opportunity to prevent stroke, which can be debilitating, is, is certainly a, a major advance. 
And uh, it's very exciting to see the field move forward. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for having me today. Appreciate it.